The thyroid truly impacts every system of the body, including the reproductive system. And because of this, there are symptoms and changes we may endure without realizing that our thyroid health is involved. And libido is one of these issues. Low sex drive, vaginal dryness, painful sex, low testosterone, yes, even in women, can all be linked to both hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. And sure, sex drive typically lowers as we age, but there are other factors that come into play and there are factors that we may be able to influence. So today on Thyroid Refresh TV, we're going to explore how our thyroid is linked to our libido and what we can do to fan those flames of sexual pleasure. Ooh, hi everyone. <laughs> and welcome to Thyroid Refresh TV our video podcast dedicated to helping you live a thyroid healthy lifestyle. We are so glad to be back with you again. I'm Dana Bowman. And I'm Jenny Mahar, and we are the dynamic duo behind Thyroid Refresh and Thyroid 30. And we're so excited to be here today with Dr. Amy Horneman to talk about libido. Welcome, Amy. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. I'm really looking forward to talking to both of you and to discussing this topic. It's a much needed one. Before we get started, I want to let everybody know a little bit about you. Uh, Amy Horneman, MSN CFMP, is a leading functional medicine expert, consults people around the world via webcam and locally in Erie, Pennsylvania. She specializes in clinically investigating underlying factors of chronic disease and customizing health programs for thyroid issues, autoimmune conditions, hormonal dysfunctions, digestive disorders, and brain problems. She's also an expert nutritionist with a master's degree in clinical nutrition and is currently a doctoral candidate. She is also a certified functional, functional medicine practitioner, and she helps people reclaim their health using scientific elements of nutrition and functional medicine. And we are so excited, as Jenny said, to have you. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you, too. Well, and you're also the host of the Thyroid Fix podcast, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, and we've been listening to that. It's a great show that we highly recommend, but we're so excited to you are just the perfect person to talk to about this topic. And guys, we're, we're just, we're going to go there today because one of our intentions for 2021 was to participate in the conversations that help us lower stigma around health topics, women's health topics. Let's take these things out of the shadows, put them in the light and educate ourselves so that we can become more empowered and informed and and healthy overall. So thank you so much for uh, being here with us today to share your wisdom and expertise on this juicy topic. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I've been, I've been working with patients for almost 25 years now and being one myself, going through as, as you both have that frustrating journey in the beginning, knowing something's wrong with you, trying to get answers, praying that that one doctor would please tell you why you feel this way and why you're gaining weight uncontrollably. So that journey really led me to where I am today, working with women one-on-one, -on -one because it, it, the frustrating piece is there and libido is a part of it. And I have so many women. So it was interesting when you when we talked about the topic for today, I have so many women saying, well, I just don't feel it. I have no libido. And of course, that's a question on my intake questionnaire for people. And it is, it's checked quite often. No libido, no libido, no libido. Well, and I think so many of us just assume, well, it's just my age or, or something else. Maybe it's my relationship or maybe it's just my autoimmune condition or my thyroid condition, you know, what is it? Where should we, where do you think we should dive in? Should we talk about the link between thyroid and libido issues to sort of frame this for our, our thyroid audience? Absolutely. We always have to start with the thyroid because that is the master gland. So that's at the top. If that's not optimized, and I always say optimal, not normal, you want it optimal. So not just falling into the standard conventional lab value ranges, not just being stuck on 
T4 only while you're still suffering with symptoms, we have to optimize the thyroid first because the downstream hormones from that will be affected if we don't start there. So optimization of the thyroid is, is first and foremost what I check, doing all of the labs, pairing up the labs with the individual, with their symptoms, looking at what medication they are on, if they are stuck on T4, if they have a conversion issue, looking all of those, looking at all of those factors first with the thyroid and then kind of trickle down into the sex hormones and we'll get into each one and, and dive into what it does and why it contributes to libido. But yeah, I, you have to start at the top of the thyroid. Mm -hmm. So how, how does that kind of trickle down then? So it starts with the thyroid and then how does that ultimately, you know, influence our sexual desire? So the thyroid being the master gland is going to have an impact on all the sex hormones down below. So when you think of, if you were thinking of like a little trickle down tree, right? You have thyroid at the top and then you have, you have pregnenolone that will tie into adrenals. We'll get to that. You have testosterone, estrogen, estra, estradiol, the different types of estrogen, progesterone, DHEA. So we have to look at all of those. Now, testosterone is, is the big one. And unfortunately, a woman will go in and say, can I have a full hormone panel? And she'll get estrogen. I think often we forget as women and even conventional docs forget that women have testosterone too. And the mm -hmm. optimal, an optimal level is vital for having a libido. So I really like women with a test level above a 25, actually more around a 40 or 50. I've had some patients that do better even at, at 60 and 70 with no androgenic side effects, meaning they're not getting excessive facial hair or acne. Uh, they're not experiencing like the water retention that you can get from too high of a test level. So it really, it comes down to personalization, but you have to look at the testosterone level in women to make sure that that is optimal. Because if that's low, we have to consider bioidentical testosterone therapy. I prefer transdermal or intramuscular injection to avoid that first pass of the liver because the last thing we want to do is stress the liver and cause estrogen dominance because then we can cycle back to the thyroid. A lot of hypothyroid patients have estrogen dominance. So we don't want to make that situation worse. We just want to get your testosterone level up so that we can help you with the libido. And then we, you know, we look at all the other hormones too, but testosterone is, is one of the big ones that will, will give you drive. It helps with, with drive. It helps with, the feeling as well as the engorgement of the vaginal area to enhance blood flow. So, you know, we know with guys, they get the Viagra that will enhance blood flow. For us, we need, I mean, we typically get pushed aside. So for women, we need to look at the test levels for not only that drive and that feeling like we want to have sex, but also getting down to the the biology of it, the actual engorgement of the vaginal area. So when we have proper blood flow, we have better pleasure. Blood flow is down, pleasure will be down, sex drive will be down, incentive will be down to even have sex. So it's all just, it, I just love how this particular topic is so tied together and connected. All the dots connect one way or another. Oh, a hundred percent. Question and, for you. Oh, I was ahead. just going to say, I have a question for you really quickly. I mean, one of the things that that really excited me about this show is I wanted to ask this specific question. What are realistic expectations around libido as we age? Because I think the listeners are thinking, you know, well, maybe she's talking to a different, uh, you know, you know, person, you know, a 25 year old or a 30 year old, a 35 or a 40, you know, when she's talking about some of these things. So let's, can we just back up just a tiny bit and give us what some realistic expectations are uh, before we get any further, if you don't mind, because I really think the listeners want to know. Absolutely. Listen, I, I always say this to my patients too. Just because let's say you hit a certain age or you hit menopause, there's no rule that says, all right, well, it's time to throw in the towel on life now. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Have sex in your 70s and 80s if you can. I mean, it, it, 
it should not stop. And no, I am not, absolutely not talking to just 20 year olds, 30 year olds, even 40 year olds. I'm talking to all women because sex is healthy. It, it, it releases pain releasing endorphins. It boosts our serotonin. I mean, it's just so good, even that connection. And we'll get to the mental part because there is a mental part of having a libido and wanting to have sex and you need, you know, your partner to be involved and not be, you know, just, okay, light switch, time to have sex, honey, that's it. That's going to play a role too, but it doesn't matter the age. It does not matter the age. You should be optimal living till the day that you die. You should feel your best. You should experience life. And part of experiencing life is having sex. I think some people get hung up too on like, well, there's some messaging that we should be having sex so often, like you should be having sex once a week or three times a week or every day (laughs) where, you know, I know that can feel really overwhelming. Well, that's really, so that will tie into the mental piece that can definitely tie back to hypothyroidism, fixing the thyroid first, because we know patients that are not optimized will experience a certain level of depression or anxiety. So that will filter into their life. Maybe they're also feeling, you know, if you're in that cycle, which we all were of not being able to lose weight, you're gaining weight, your body feels out of control. All of that is going to just pile onto a woman's shoulders and then add one more thing of, of societal pressure of, well, you really should be having sex so many times per week. Oh my goodness. I mean, that's just going to crush her mental libido. You know, she's not <laughs> going to feel good about herself. She's not going to feel confident battling depression and anxiety already. And then let's amp up the anxiety just a little bit more with societal pressure. So I don't, I really don't believe that there's a, a, a formula you know, that really comes down to pretty much you and your partner figuring out what works for you and what works for your relationship. But if we can get you to the place of understanding maybe why you don't have a libido, checking all the boxes, getting optimized, then you can work on the the communication part with your partner, the desire part, the, the foreplay part, the mental part. That's kind of all over here. How many times a week you both decide to have sex. That's really over here, but the physiological part has to come first. Mm, I love the way that you sort of discern mm-hmm. that, you know, there's the physiological libido piece and there's also the mental piece, which is really significant. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to go back a little bit too, because I know we sort of started to touch on like all mm-hmm. this, you know, complex hormonal picture and not just hormones, but our whole system you know, Mm -hmm. body, mind, all of it, all the pieces of the puzzle. So how do we begin to discern whether our low libido is due to our thyroid, due to other hormones, due to aging? How Mm -hmm. do we find those answers? Mm -hmm. Test it all. (laughs) Test, don't guess. So like I said, starting with the thyroid, getting all of the testing, and I mean all of it. So not just TSH, not just free T4, you need the free T3, the reverse T3, the antibodies, because we need to see the TPO and TGA antibodies to see if there is the presence of Hashimoto's. If you've never been tested before, for that matter, even if you have been diagnosed with hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's, get them retested so we can see where your levels are with that. Are you on the proper medication? Are you doing the right things? Obviously all the different aspects that come into play with proper thyroid conversion, T4 to T3 conversion. So that's where we're pulling in the estrogen. Let's test your estrogen because if you're estrogen dominant, that's going to interfere with T4 to T3 conversion, downregulate the thyroid, obviously affects affect the downstream sex hormones, in addition to giving you all the hypo symptoms of not being able to lose weight and being depressed and anxious. So estrogen first and foremost, and then you have to remember that estrogen is also lubricating for the vaginal muco- mucosa. So if you, you talked about pain during intercourse, if someone is walking around with low estrogen, that's how we have to test, not guess, low estrogen, we can use actually a, a bioidentical vaginal estriol 
that works really well. It does not push women into estrogen dominance and it helps with that lubrication. So now it's less painful. You want it more. We're starting to balance out the hormones. We have to check progesterone. Progesterone is the balancing hormone. So oftentimes a woman, a woman will come back with labs that show estrogen in the normal range, quote, quote, but then we look at progesterone and it's in the basement. Well, that is still a state of estrogen dominance. So that's going to come back and affect T4 to T3 conversion of the thyroid. So it's, it's all about thorough testing. I've seen women with testosterone levels okay, but DHEA is in the tank. DHEA is a precursor to testosterone. So sometimes, and that's easy, that's, that's, we can treat supplementally for that. And oftentimes that helps support the adrenals, which is another factor in this whole libido game, but it, testing all the hormones, thorough testing of the thyroid, testing the adrenals. So when we are talking about cortisol, doing something like a four point salivary cortisol panel to see what the cortisol pattern is throughout the day, to see if high cortisol is going to get in the way of T4 to T3 conversion of the thyroid. Um, see if, if even just having that higher cortisol is going to increase stress which will then in turn affect a woman's mental state, which will equal low libido. So everything is tied together. We just have to, you know, to answer your question, Jenny, just test, mm -hmm. test, not guess, get that full picture instead of these little pieces of the puzzle, or then we have to go back and test more. And then we go back and test more. Let's just get it all laid out in front of us mm -hmm. so we can say, <laughs> okay, here's what's going on. Here's the big picture, the whole enchilada. So, mm -hmm. You mentioned salivary cortisol testing. What about for all the other hormones? Do you like the Dutch test? Is there is there a test that you or tests that you really like to use with your clients? You know, I, I mean, I know this is a, a debate amongst practitioners. A lot of practitioners love the Dutch test, which I do too. If a patient comes to me and they had a Dutch test done, bring it on. I love to dive into it and look at it, but it's so expensive. So if I have a patient that is a little bit financially burdened already, um, let's say they are even just paying out of pocket for, or paying high co-pays for the, the blood tests that we are trying to get, then I, I kind of tiptoe around that. If, if someone has, is, has a tight budget, let's just go by serum. You know, let's try to nail that on day 20 to 22 of your cycle if you are still cycling, but let's just go by serum, push it through your insurance and, and we'll decipher. If something is really, really off and I go, you know what? These hormones are just all over the place. We need to go one step further. We need to look at the, the methylation of the hormones. Then we'll go into the Dutch test. Um, we can do salivary cortisol with hormones as well. So ZRT offers that. They're really great about that. And a lot of practitioners prefer salivary hormones as well as salivary cortisol. Um, I try to just work with what the patient can afford. Mm, can so we just stop because... really quick and just say, that's amazing. And our listeners are going to value and love that. So thank you for that, because it's a really big deal, especially now, especially with what's going on in the world. People really, um, they need it and they want it to come from you that you say it so they don't always have to say it, right? Like, okay, well, okay, that sounds great, except for um, I can't afford that, right? And so for you to mention it first, I think that's really amazing. So thank you for that for all of our listeners. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's such a huge roadblock for people and it stops so many of us from getting the answers we need. And while, you know, we feel like we're always saying, try to be open to the, the possibilities that out of pocket, you know, there's so many tools that mm -hmm. we may need to pay out of pocket for. Try not to be just closed to the, to that idea. Mm -hmm. But when we can, work with, you know, we pay so much for health insurance here in the U.S. Yeah. When we can put that to work and find practitioners who are willing to work with us within a budget, within that system of let's see what we can get over here. We can, you know, add a little bit over here with maybe some other tests that aren't covered. And we can that way get a, a still a very complete, helpful picture to start tackling some of this stuff. So that's great. Yeah. 
And that's how I even approach supplements with my patients. I, I tell them, listen, we're not going to send you away with a bag full of stuff. I don't even sell them. You know, I will recommend exactly therapeutically what you need. And you're going to understand why you're using it. I, I do not believe in patients having you know, 20, 30 different supplements and we're just crossing our fingers that it's going to help. I want people to, to stream. You're already investing in your health. You're already right. taking that step to invest and, and find out what is going on with you. The last thing you want is hidden expenses with additional testing and not understanding why you're taking something and and just the overuse the supplementation. So I like I I like it streamlined for people mm. just to be able to afford it. Yeah. So test, don't guess, work with a, a experienced functional medicine practitioner who can help you sort out what the test results mean. What about lifestyle? What else can we do? to influence or boost our libido? So right now, especially with the state of the world and all the stress going on, we are across the board seeing more dysregulated cortisol than ever, than pretty much ever. And, and like we said earlier, cortisol will have an effect on your thyroid. It'll have an, an effect on weight gain. It will have a, an effect on your mood. So just doing simple things like de-stressing, doing yoga, doing meditation. And believe me, when I say meditation, if you were to ask me about a year, year and a half ago about meditation, I'd be like, yeah, I don't have time for that. Okay. Once you dive into the science of how your brain waves change, how your cortisol levels change, your blood sugar changes. So we can actually start to chip away at insulin resistance, which is often tied to hypothyroidism, which also, you know, the high insulin will result in low testosterone. So there we go, tying it back to libido again and low T. When we can use something like a meditation app, to do 10 minutes of deep breathing, 10 minutes of meditation. And we know scientifically that it has an impact on your hormones. It has an impact on your hormones. Then I, I can buy into it a lot more and I can better tell people to do this because we can see actual changes in your body. And that's a simple lifestyle change. I mean, that's, that's easy breezy right there. Go to the app store, download an app. There's like five or 10 of them now. Uh, for meditation. So something like that, you know, it has been said, if you can't find 10 minutes to meditate, you probably need an hour. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that is so true. Yeah. Right. I love that, that is so true. So little things like that. And then of course, getting into the, the nutritional component, lowering processed foods and sugar. It seems so simple, so cliche. We hear it all the time everywhere. But again, understanding the why, because I, when we're talking about insulin resistance, if you are a hypothyroid patient, I would bet 99% of you have insulin resistance. And then we, I mean, we could do a separate podcast on that, the different numbers to look at insulin, A1C, fasting glucose. But if you have insulin resistance, that's going to push down your testosterone. And then in some cases, it's actually going to cause estrogen dominance too. So things that we can do to lower insulin, removing processed foods, lowering sugar content, eliminating sugar completely, um, and doing just exercising lowers your insulin and brings that insulin glucose balance back into alignment. So simple lifestyle changes really will have an impact on hormones and thyroid and insulin and testosterone and thus libido. And just about everything. Pretty Mental much. Health and all of that, <laughs> all that good stuff. Yep. Well, it's great yep. to know that there's things we can do just on a daily basis to mm -hmm. sort of move the needle on our libido. I did want to ask you about what we often see sort of marketed as the silver bullet for low libido, which is maca. Can we mm -hmm. talk about maca? Because here's been our experience with maca. And of course, you know, we're, we're thyroid patient advocates. We're moms with Hashimoto's. You know, we, we are really good at collecting expert advice and content and um, finding voices that are, you know, in that, on that same mission of empowering and informing thyroid patients. 
And so there are a lot of different opinions on maca, and we've certainly heard it recommended by people we very much, you know, respect, and it's it's definitely piqued our interest. Now, I started trying to develop a couple recipes using maca powder, mm -hmm. and when I went to write the post, I always include, like, in our recipes, what are the thyroid um, supporting properties of the ingredients in this recipe, I ended up not posting the maca recipes that I came up with because of issues around is maca a thyroid suppressant? Does it need to be cooked? There's all these different types. It just, I just went, I just can't in good comfortably. conscience just mm -hmm. comfortably do this. Not saying I'm against it or for it one way or the other, but can you enlighten us a little bit on maca and and maybe dispel some myths and tell us how it can be used, how it should be used and things like that? Sure. So just like I would say maca is probably one next to iodine, one of the most debated supplements when it comes to hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's as to what to use, how much to use. Should we use it at all? Should we use it with this group of patients? What kind I mean, it's just, it, it, you will see the community, the functional medicine community split in their opinions on MACA. Now we can get into, let's say the clinical trials. So when we, when we look at clinical trials, you know, Google Scholar, PubMed, we'll find that MACA works really well for patients who have experienced low libido due to being on an SSRI. So as we know, many hypothyroidism patients, especially when they're first getting diagnosed, they get that Band-Aid. Here's an antidepressant. And it's not really that they need the antidepressant, it's that they need their thyroid fixed first. Mm -hmm. And then they, now there are, there's a group that ha, they legitimately need the antidepressant. I, I understand that. I'm not talking about that group. I'm talking about the group that gets it as a Band-Aid and then experiences the low libido due to that SSRI's effect on the endocrine system, their hormones, and, and thus libido. So we find that maca root works really well for that group. When we go out of the clinical studies and we go into, let's say, anecdotal evidence, in my practice, so I'll just be, I mean, there might be practitioners out there that are using maca and they're like, no, I have a 90% um, benefit rate with my patients. I, I understand. But with anecdotal evidence and speaking what I have seen in my practice, when women come to me and they've already tried it and they did this, they, they do the raw organic Peruvian. I mean, there is one company that kind of stands above the rest um, in terms of their, their sourcing and production and what they offer in terms of the black, the red, gelatinized, uh, things that you can use to cook with, the capsules. And, and they might even be using a really, really good company, but they are experiencing horrible side effects. So one of my patients used the um, red maca, which has very strong androgenic properties. So she ended up break, just like we talked about earlier with testosterone and going too high, she ended up breaking out, cystic acne, horrible sweating, um, ended up putting on weight, putting on water weight and, and fat weight before she stopped it. And was just like, this is it. I just, it comes all back to when I started the maca. Um, I've had patients that you just uh, went on, um, well, it's very color and dose dependent. So they went on, let's say, a, a multi one that had black and the red. They, you know, they thought the more means better, and that's not always the case. And they also experienced almost like a down regulation of their thyroid. So they, even though they were optimizing their medication and labs, hypothyroid symptoms came back. And it's kind of like we just, you know, when you start doing the math and you're looking, you're going, okay, well when did this start? When did this start? It all goes back to when they started the maca. So that's why I, I am in the camp of, if you have used it and it worked for you, great. Then I am not saying to not use it. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying if you keep using it, you're going to tank your thyroid. <laughs> there are studies that show that it's not great with hypothyroid patients. So 
I'm kind of in the camp that, you know, if something isn't broke, let's not fix it. If you come to me and you're on it and you're like, this has changed my life, then absolutely stay on it. But it's not something that I would roll the dice with in the beginning. I would do all the other fixing first, all the other testing, all the other balancing, all the other treatments and from supplements to bioidentical hormone replacement that we could do first. And then if it's like, well, you're just a disaster. I don't know why this isn't working, why this isn't working. <laughs> Maybe let's try some maca and see what happens. Right. Um, so that's kind of where I am with the whole thing. It, it's so, um, it, 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 it just like, like people take probiotics, it has to be tailored to each patient. But what you'll find, I'm sure you guys hear this too, everybody's taking a probiotic every single day, the same one day after day, maybe they're eating some activia. And it's like, no, that's not how probiotics are meant to be used. We need to find out what strains that you need. So maca being an adaptogen, we need to find out what, what type you need, what color you need, what dose you need, what's gonna actually work with your body chemistry. We well, are so bio-individual, that's for sure. Very much so. And I love that you pointed out, you know, let's start with the, the big picture. Let's get the real answers and do the testing because, hey, it's so much easier to just buy a bottle of supplements that somebody <laughs> said was going to solve all my problems. Mm -hmm. I can skip all that other stuff, right? No, wrong. Start at the beginning, do the detective work. You will save yourself so much time and money in the long run. I did want to ask, though, so because I know, uh, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in um, our, you know, um, natural food store apothecaries and things like that, that, where it's like, this is a raw product. And one of the things that I learned about maca was this is a, a indigenous food to Peru and Peruvians really they feel you don't, you shouldn't use maca in its raw form. Do you have an opinion on that? Should we be concerned about if we are using maca? Should we be concerned if our supplement or our bag of maca powder or whatever is raw as thyroid patients? Because that they're, the concern is that the raw maca can suppress the thyroid. Right, and that's that's what we're seeing in the in the studies or in the articles um, on maca is is the raw form is the one that that suppresses the thyroid. So then it comes down to okay, well, if you are a hypothyroid patient with low libido and we've done everything else and we want to try maca, maybe we do use it in the like the gelatinized form in the cooked form, and we also have to go back to. Um, kind of like a, a primal theory or, or an indigenous theory. So the Peruvians have been using this for years. Their body has a different makeup than, than we do mm -hmm. in the U.S. So what works or doesn't work for them can also be almost like um, – primal, uh, cultural. Genetically so it, imprinted. Genet yes, yeah. yes, yeah. exactly. So we have to look at that too and look at even a lot of the studies out that are published, like Google Scholar PubMed on MACA uses specific groups of people. And you really have to look at that when you're looking through studies. You can't just blanket. If it says, you know, we studied the effect of X, Y, Z on um, an Asian culture, well, you can't blanket that if, if you're Caucasian. You have to tie it to, to your ethnicity and your culture and, and where you live. Um, all that has to be taken into consideration. So sorry, mm -hmm. going back to your raw question. <laughs> yes, I, I would say if I, I would just, I would be hesitant as a, as a hypothyroid patient, I would be hesitant. Now that's not to say, again, I have had patients come in who are using a really good maca and I won't mention the, the company, but really good maca. Um, everything that I looked at, wow, this company has a down pad. They know their stuff. They've been doing this for a long, long time, as much as you can find out from a website and looking at it. And hey, it worked for this patient. So maybe there's something to it, good for them, but it wouldn't be my first recommendation. So basically, maca is an amazing, um, you know, plant. Uh, is, it, is it a root? I think it's a root. Is yeah. it a root? It's right. A root. Right. It's a root. So it's, it's, it's amazing, but it's not necessarily amazing for everybody. It just isn't. And you got to kind of dig a little deeper and you may end up being one of those people who loves and can take maca. But until you dig, as you said earlier, we just won't know. Right. Tests don't guess. 
Test don't guess. Yep. And sometimes it is trial and error, right? Mm -hmm. So even when we're going back to hypothyroid patients and the, the T3 only group, sometimes you have a reverse T3 that's elevated and we know, or you have the DIY1, DIY2 enzyme, and we know that you don't convert very well. And sometimes we go, you know what, just pull out the T4 for a little bit and let's see how you feel. So it's the same thing with maca. Like if you are at the end of your rope and we've tried everything and you want to throw it in or we want to throw it in, we try it. And then we see how you feel because it ultimately comes down to how do you feel? Yes, we can look at test results all day long, but how do you feel? And if you feel better, then there might be something to this. But if you feel worse and you're getting things like acne, cystic acne, night sweats, you feel like you're going into menopause and you're 30, it, then we got to back off and pull it out. So you, we, can, we can always try it. It's an option out there. Hmm. Before we wrap it up, are there any other supplements you want to mention in regards to libido? So pregnenolone is one that we've been using more, especially now, because pregnenolone is the kind of the, I want to call it the mac daddy precursor to hormones. So thyroid, the thyroid gland is the, is the master, hands down. Pregnenolone affects all the downstream sex hormones. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, and cortisol. And what, what is happening and what's been happening now, especially with the increased stress, even if you're not affected by, let's say, a job loss or a huge financial hit, there is that underlying ongoing stress going on right now in the world. So what we're seeing is the pregnenolone steal. So the adrenals get taxed, they get taxed, they get taxed. We need cortisol to survive. And we have to remember that cortisol is not the bad guy. You know, we don't want too much. We don't want you drop down low in baseline, uh, you know, riding a low wave of cortisol, but we do need some cortisol. So the body knows that. And what it will do is it will steal pregnenolone to make cortisol. And when you take away the MAC daddy, then the downstream hormones are going to get, you know, shorted. So we're going to see lower DHEA, lower testosterone, lower progesterone, lower estrogen because of the pregnenolone steal. So when we add in pregnenolone, what we're finding, especially in women, is it does help to kind of nurture the adrenals, especially if someone's not tanked. You know, if we do a four-point salivary and their, their cortisol pattern is okay and there's just a couple points that are off, they're not just tanked and they're not in complete you know, adrenal exhaustion, we can use pregnenolone just to kind of nurture a little bit. And even if we are using bioidentical hormone replacement, like we're using a micronized progesterone or an estradiol vaginal cream, you can still use pregnenolone just to kind of, again, just kind of like soothe and nurture all the downstream hormones. So that's really a good one. Of course, you know, brand matters. Um, I like the control release pregnenolone. So it's kind of released slowly throughout the day. So you're not getting one big hit. Uh, a lot of people will take it at night and have it slow release through the night because just like pre progesterone, it has kind of a calming effect, not, not as big of a calming effect as progesterone does, but um, sometimes used with the micronized progesterone, it really helps women sleep better. And then we can go back to lifestyle factors. If you're not sleeping, then your insulin's going to be way off and it's going to tie back to libido too. So yeah, kind of in a nutshell, I like um, pregnenolone. I also like berberine for insulin resistance. I talk a lot about berberine on my podcast. I have found, I actually did, I wrote a paper and it was published. Um, I had a patient, male, not hypothyroid. So this is totally outside of our thyroid realm, but full-blown insulin dependent diabetic. And he called me and said, I do not want to be on insulin the rest of my life. What can we do? And of course, we incorporated a low-carb diet for him. But we used berberine with his the insulin that he was prescribed. And his A1C went from a 13.9 to a 5.4 in six months. Totally reversed his diabetes. So I wow. love berberine for my hypo patients because you're already struggling to lose weight. Your insulin's all over the place on a roller coaster. Berberine just comes in and makes a nice wave-like pattern takes away those carb and sugar cravings so you can just naturally choose better choices and reduce the processed food and the sugar like we talked about earlier. So that's another one of my favorites too. Mm, great wow, to know about these. Yeah. Right. 
Thank you so much, Amy. This has been incredibly fascinating and so helpful. Thank you for sharing all this so such valuable information with our audience. Do you um, have maybe just a three main takeaways for our listeners today? So going back to the big one, test, don't guess. Make sure, start at the top with thyroid. Even if you don't know whether or not you are hypothyroid, maybe you haven't been diagnosed yet, get a full thyroid panel. Get a full hormone panel. So test, don't guess. Work with someone. So even when you're looking in the integrative and functional space, make sure that they know thyroid and hormones because maybe their specialty is, you know, pediatric uh, brain development. They're not going to know thyroid inside and out, backwards and forwards. So make sure that you find somebody that does really, really know the thyroid and knows how to work with hormones. Um, and then finally, I would say do the light, implement the lifestyle changes because they're simple and cheap. You, know, you can do the, you can do meditation for free and you can start going through your cupboard and throwing things out um, without using the excuse that it's in there for the kids or in there for your husband or your grandkids, just throw it out because if it's in there, you're going to go grab it. So let's lower the insulin. Let's take out the, the inflammatory food so that maybe even your hormones can start balancing out on their own, even with, with some simple lifestyle changes. Mm, definitely. Awesome. People love to hear that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today to talk about libido, Amy. This has been incredible. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. <laughs> for our listeners, you can find Dr. Amy Horniman's website at Amy, that's A-M-I-E, Horniman, H-O-R-N-A-M-A-N.com, or you can find her on the Thyroid Fix podcast. And Amy, you have a lab and symptom checklist that listeners can download, right? Yes. So if you go to my website, you will find free guides. And on there, there is a lab and symptom checklist that I love people to grab because number one, a lot of the symptoms that are on there are kind of eye-opening, things that, that get overlooked when we're talking about hypothyroidism, like frozen shoulder and achy joints and vision problems. So look at that symptom checklist and see how many correlate to you and what you're experiencing. And then the labs on there will tell you all of the different labs that you need to get, as well as the opt of the functional medicine optimal value. So if you're getting labs done and you get that phone call, oh yeah, you're normal, everything's fine. And you're still, you know, you're like, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. Compare your labs, get your own copy, compare your labs to the optimal functional ranges where we like to see you, where we know, you know, around about here is where you are going to feel your best. So compare your labs with that. I think it'll be very, it's a very helpful tool. Mm -hmm. We'll be sure and include that in the show notes as well. So listeners can find it there. Thank you all for joining us for another episode of Thyroid Refresh TV, where we give you the inspiration and information you need to live thyroid healthy. You can check out our thyroid friendly recipes, workouts, meditations, and more at thyroidrefresh.com. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes. It would make our day. We so appreciate your listenership and your support. We're Dana and Jenny wishing you the best of health. See you guys next time. See you next time. Mm -hmm.